Hey everyone, Norm from Tested here. I am here at Valve Software, or Valve, and uh, they've invited us to go hands-on with their Steam Deck. You may have heard of this. This is their upcoming handheld gaming PC, okay. essentially. It runs on a custom AMD uh, GPU, CPU, their APU, um, and it basically has the power of a modern gaming PC uh, running a custom version of Steam on Linux, uh, running, although Windows games, via a Proton emulator. So this is hardware that's still in the prototype stage. They're getting units like this off to developers to ensure full compatibility. Um, but what I want to do here today is get a sense of how games play on the Steam Deck have some time with games that are traditional PC games, games that have been console ports, as well as if I can, grab some of the Valve designers to ask questions about the hardware design and the ergonomics and their plans for this as a platform going forward. But it's the Steam Deck. So one thing, that is immediately okay. apparent yeah. is the, the yeah. form factor, right? This is much larger than uh, your Nintendo Switch, for example, who you want to use that as a form factor comparison. It's a bigger screen, there's a lot more input in terms of buttons. Not only do you have thumbsticks, D-pad, ABXY, but you also have trigger buttons as well as these paddles in the back as well. Uh, really throwing in the kitchen sink in terms of input. Also track pads uh, that have what they call HD haptics. So uh, based on their experience developing those Steam controllers as well as the haptics on the Valve Index controllers, uh, this has that same ability to emulate uh, a mouse cursor or a trackball, including acceleration, uh, which some games maybe play better with also, the UI seems to be a big part of their design. It's not the Windows version of Steam. It's not big picture mode. Uh, I think, from what I've heard, this is kind of going to be the foundation for their screen or Steam on this kind of form factor going forward, whether they call it small picture mode, whatever, in the future. But the tiles representing the games, the uh, the access to the Steam menu, Steam input for configuring controllers, uh, all of that seems to be reskinned, or they're in the process of reskinning to optimize for this form factor, optimize for things like you know brightness. Wi-Fi, basically the things that you would need for almost like a gaming laptop uh, with a gamepad controller. Think about that. If you had a, game, a gaming laptop, but you primarily interface with it with either a gamepad or a touchscreen, that's how they have to think about that uh, for the Steam Deck, even though you, of course, can attach a Bluetooth mouse, USB mouse, USB keyboard using the USB-C port. Uh, there's expandable storage right here. Uh, and I'm not gonna go through all the speeds and feeds. You can find that anywhere on the internet. Um, but in terms of ergonomics, it does feel good in my hands. Um, I have my elbows on my knees, so it's, you know, for long play sessions, it definitely feels like you want to brace your elbows, and the weight feels lighter than I think I had imagined in my head. Most of the weight feels like it's in the center here, the battery, the processor, the screen, uh, and in the time that I've been playing with it, it hasn't gotten hot on the sides, though it does feel noticeably warm when a game is running full bore uh, near the fans here. Lawrence, I'd love to ask you some questions about just uh, how you guys came to this this form factor and its architecture, because uh, 
it's supposed to be like a PC, right? Yeah. Um, and but it's mobile. It's running on battery, so I imagine there's trade-offs in terms of power and heat. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you came to this form factor? Yeah, at a high level, um, as you can see, like the, the bulk of the, the volume is actually um, in these handle sections, and that was actually really important to us from an ergonomic standpoint to actually make it feel really comfortable to hold. Uh, you can almost imagine it as like a gamepad that's been cut in half and a screen was put in the middle. Yes, and you guys um, have experience with you know yeah, the Steam controller. We have, we have experience with controllers. We have experience with displays. Um, a lot of the past experience we've had with hardware, hardware. Uh, is uh, just building up to this point, and a lot of it has been introduced into this product. Oh my god, I forgot a control scheme. For for thermals and things, we really wanted it to be away from where your hands would be. Yeah. So all of the hot, anything that would get warm would be in the center. And as you see, we have airflow here and here. So your hands will never feel warm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, we did spend a lot of time making sure that the architecture of it made sure that it never got too hot and they wouldn't have to deal with throttling or anything like that. Um, I think of it almost like a laptop design. How laptops, yeah. you know, have you know the thermals, they have fans, or parts of it that you expect to get hot, but it's far away from where your keyboard is or the trackpad is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah the same sorts of considerations. Uh, but also, uh, like TDP can change with the, when it's plugged in or running off of battery. Is that something that also happens here, where you're running the the the, the processor and the graphics at a certain, you know, performance level, performance target? Mm -hmm. I believe that TDP doesn't actually change whether it's plugged in or not. Oh wow! Well. Performance should actually still be the same. I want to double check with one of my team members about that. Sure, sure. But you should have the, the same performance whether it's plugged in or docked or anything. It's just the same computer, the same processor running. The way you have designed the idea is that it'll be mobile for mm -hmm. most of the, I mean, that's why the form factor is, is this exactly. way. Mm -hmm. um, touchpad, super interesting. Uh, you guys had those actuators underneath the SIEM controller. You guys have haptic stuff in the, the index controllers. Yep. How similar are these to, to those? Uh, very similar. A lot of the stuff that we learned from those have, have made their way into these, uh, into, these the, uh, into the haptics and into the trackpads and the, um, yeah, into the circuit. I noticed the triggers don't have an extra depress, like you don't yeah, click it's in. A, it's not a two stages. Mm. And that was a conscious decision on your guys' part. Yeah. Got it. So we do a lot of things to try to optimize the controller for the same play experience that you get on other controllers. Uh, Got it. It's popular between Xbox and PlayStation. So right. I tried to bring all the best parts of those and try to make like a really um, high quality pro level controller like you'd expect from. Yeah. Um, the it's going to ship running a version of Linux uh, with Proton for the, uh, the emulation. Um, is there a performance drop? In, uh, you guys have noticed in testing running natively on Windows versus um, Linux? No, there's, actually, we haven't noticed a performance drop. We definitely have seen really great results with it mm. uh, running through Proton. Um, um, but if you wanted to install Windows, would it have a Steam Deck interface on Windows? Or are you running then just Steam? You would just be running the Steam. Windows interface. You would run Steam, but it'd be similar. You can run it at full screen, or yeah. and, and and the and controllers. This interface, uh, we do want to eventually replace Big Picture mode. Oh, okay. So, in essence, once we roll that out in the future, you could run in Windows mode, run in the Steam basically gamepad UI mode, and then have a similar experience. Oh, this is a small picture mode, not the the big picture mode. Come up with a name. Yeah, good idea for it. Okay, cool. Um, and how do the drivers and updates? Like, you know, I have a traditional game console. You download one package that mm -hmm. updates firmware drivers for everything. Yes. If I'm on Windows or if I'm in here, what's the? Uh... Yeah, uh, it's a good question, and it's actually something that we can uh, do. So, like, oh, okay. system, Steam client, and BIOS updates are all done together. I'll download as one, you can update as one. So one big package you yeah. will release. It does all the right things. I mean, the benefit of us creating both the hardware and the software for this thing is we know exactly what this needs. We know exactly what firmware it needs, what drivers it needs. So a customer never has to have you know the real PC experience. Yeah. Looking online for the right driver for their specific configuration. But uh, for okay. Windows, you can do that? Or would it be just be an AMD package? Uh, I believe so. I think it should just take the, it should just like, it's, a, it's a, actually a good question that I don't know. Mm, yeah. to, to be determined. To be determined. I mean, when we install Windows on these things, it just works. It just works. Right, right. We haven't, I don't believe we've had to install any drivers because it's Windows. Got it. Got it. Um, and this right now is close to a point where you're sending out to developers so they can 
primarily work with the, the interface and the UI for launching games? Yeah, well, primarily it's uh, to get an idea of how their game run on this thing mm. and then make any updates that they may want to make to it. So um, just to make sure that it, it runs great on day. Um, yeah, we're really excited to, to get these into developer hands. Like they're, um, you know, really important to, to make sure that they have everything they need to make the games that they want to make. Yeah. Uh, and having developer games will help that out. You know, you think about the Steam experience in Windows, and you boot up a game, sometimes the game launches immediately, sometimes you get a pop-up, you know, if it's an EA game, you're gonna maybe get an Origin pop-up, an Ubisoft game, you get a Uplay pop-up. These aren't experiences that you necessarily want when you have a handheld. You know, if someone's coming from a Nintendo Switch, you want the entry into the game to be as frictionless, as smooth as possible. And I think that's something that Valve is also working with. It's one of the reasons they're getting this into the hands of developers, uh, so that not necessarily for optimizing the graphics, because it can be optimized for the screen resolution. A lot of games have those optimizations built in, um, but also for how to get you into the game as smoothly as possible without having to attach a keyboard, attach a mouse, mouse input, you know, a username and ID. It should just work when you press the A button or tap the play button. So porting a game to the Steam Deck, input is a real strong consideration, right? Uh, does it work out of the box like this is supposed to mimic an Xbox or PlayStation controller, a standard Bluetooth controller? If I wanna configure that, what does that configuration look like? I'm here in Fallen Order and the menu is right out of, you know, it's a stock menu for uh, configuring the controls. And if I hit edit controls, it looks like I'm using their Fallen Order UI for configuring it, but that won't always be the case. There'll be games where if I hit edit controls, it's gonna pop up the Steam input menu, kind of like you would be in, in Steam VR or in the desktop Windows version of Steam. Uh, we're gonna use there the Valve interface for loading and preloading uh, configurations and sharing your inputs. And so that kind of consistency is gonna be a thing I think they're working on as well. So Scott, you're booting this up. Uh, you know these are early units. You know they're they're bugs. You guys are still working out. Uh, when a user boots it up, um, it's loading the Linux version of Steam. If I want to sideload Windows or different OS, I presume that's possible. Um, what's the mechanism to to do that? Well, I mean you can you can of course format the drive and put anything you want to on there. I mean we're not gonna restrict that in any way, but you could also dual boot like you would with a traditional, a traditional desktop system if you wanted to, you know, put a Windows drive on there. So BIOS would be accessible to the user? Yeah. Is it a... It's like a basically a button combination when you're booting up and you can access the BIOS. So oh, okay. Yeah. Um, that relates to, then, I guess, the, the motherboard. You know, you're working with AMD, uh, they're making the, the APU for this. Is the board design from them or from you guys? And Kind of who's responsible for that, uh, that most management? Of that is, most of that is internal. Um, so we've done most of the board design here. Um, but of course, we work closely with AMD on the actual APU and like everything was needed, of course, to mm. do all the various like, USB and all that sort of stuff. Um, but you guys are kind of choosing which chips for the controllers, for the wireless, all that all the I.O. stuff, the uh, interfacing with the screen, as if you were like a, a laptop manufacturer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, all the controls and everything is always on the in-house, as is the main thing. Will people be able to overclock their Steam Decks? I'm not sure at this point. Uh, yeah, I'm probably not the best person to answer that, maybe. <laughs> I, I'm not really sure. Yeah, obviously with all the caveats of you know avoiding a warranty or something. Um, I want to ask about these, the, the trackpads. So you're involved with the, with the, the Steam controllers, and uh, those had very specific, uh, what you guys were going for was something that could have the same fidelity of a, as a mouse. Right, or at least like a trackball. And yeah. um, we're seeing all the iterations of that. Um, how did you guys end up with this form factor for the trackpad? Um, and is it fundamentally the same technology? Um, it is an improved technology over what we shipped with the Steam controller. But there's a, there's, you know, with the Steam controller, we were trying to unlock a bunch of games that didn't support controllers or, um, you know, just existed before there was like any kind of widespread controller support on PC. Mm. Um, so we're really trying to unlock those games. And that, to some degree, still exists. Um, but also, there's, there's a class of players who, you know, they don't like controlling, say, an FPS game with with uh, a, 
a joystick, right? And there's a ton of console players that are amazing at it, but for yeah. a lot of PC players that are like, I've only played with the mouse, they're, they're not used to it. And the trackpad gives a much more one-to-one -one sort of feel for that kind of interaction. Um, so that combined with the gyro allows quite a bit better experience. Like you can reach, you know, a very similar feel to what you have with the mouse because you're, you're both using your thumb to do sort of the large macro movements and then using your whole arm and wrist to do the micro movements. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Gyro isn't... Both gyro and touchscreen aren't things that we think of as part of traditional PC games. Not really, but the thing is, we can through Steam input, we can hook them into any existing game that can that can use a mouse or a game right? And so it sort of allows. It's interesting once you once you played with it a little bit, your brain really integrates the two things because you're you're both using your thumb and your arm in tandem, um, and. It just becomes one thing. It feels super natural after you've done it a few times. Well, same reason you guys put the paddles in as well. Just yeah, I mean, part of those are like people just you know, it's it's unused space that people like, mm. like to have additional buttons on. But you know, obviously, not taking your hands off the controls is a nice thing for a lot of, of games. You can have every finger have some type of button Something input. That you can access, yeah. yeah. Oh. Uh, in terms of. Um, uh, you know the, the frame rate that your guys are going for. Um, I, I know there's been talk about like a 30 FPS baseline performance. Um, how do you think about that, and how does that actually implemented? Well, I mean, it's it's basically a target we have where we what well, we consider <laughs> the sort of baseline acceptable perf. Like most games run above that, but it is a like a lot of this is up to, to users, right? Like on, on any sort of desktop PC. We're running the same game, so you can set them, you know, to whatever settings. If, if you prioritize, you know, the graphics over the performance, you can crank things way up. If you prefer to maximize your frame rate, you can crank things way down, and any any kind of combination there. So, like, we think that that's a, a strength. Like, some people, they want just frame rate overall, right? Like, yeah. And and other people are like, oh, I don't really notice the difference. I just want to look pretty, right? They're not. Uh, and, and those are both valid ways to look at and play the games, right? And so we think that's just the strength of being able to set it up how you want. All right, well, that was an exciting day, and I'm back home now after a little bit of a whirlwind travel day. Flew up to Seattle this morning. We got about an hour and a half of time to spend with the Steam Deck over at Valve and also to chat with some of the Valve team, uh, and now back Home. And I apologize for some of the audio quality in some of the conversations we had with the Valve team. One of our microphones did unfortunately crap out during the shoot, uh, but I thought the, uh, the information was interesting enough that I wanted to salvage it as best as possible and let you hear it firsthand. And we were in a bit of a, a noisy room, unfortunately, as you saw and heard. A lot of stuff going on, a lot of stuff we were trying to do in that 90 minutes with the Steam Deck. And now that it's the end of the day, I had a little more time to think about uh, our time with it. And I actually left with way more questions uh, than answers, um, but also a lot of thoughts. Now, I think it's fair to Think about the Steam Deck in both uh, the hardware terms as well as uh, the version of Steam OS that's going to run on this. And in terms of hardware, you know, we knew kind of the speeds and feeds, it running that AMD Zen 2 CPU, RDNA 2 from the GPU, right? Uh, kind of the equivalent of uh, uh, the similar architecture as what you'd find in current gen consoles or a high-end gaming PC, or gaming laptop at least. Uh, but what we 
couldn't really tell in that time was you know long-term performance. We know that Valve is targeting that 20 watt TTP uh, and that the Steam Deck will run at full power, potential full power, even when it's unplugged and not plugged in the USB. Um, and in the time that we had in loading games like Doom Eternal and Jedi Fallen Order, uh, running the games look great on that 1280 by 800 resolution screen. Uh, going into the settings, even you know, doing a little bit of adjusting of the settings, I didn't really see the frame rates dip to a point that it became unplayable. Uh, and the screen is 60 hertz. You know, to Valve's credit, as they say that in their testing, these kind of these games will run at that baseline of 30 hertz. It did feel reasonable. Uh, also, you know, they got hot. The back of the unit where you saw the, the fan vents and where that uh, heat pipe is, uh, it. As expected, like a gaming PC, that part got hot. But where I was holding the controller and holding the Steam Deck at the controller portions of it, uh, the left and right ends, uh, that was comfortable to hold for extended periods of time. Um, we don't have full benchmarks. We aren't able to really compare it against a desktop or a gaming laptop at this point. But what we were able to see did at least help me believe that it could play current games uh, without having compromised a lot of the graphical settings. Uh, but what we can talk about in terms of hardware is the, the feel, the ergonomics of this device with that seven inch screen, with all the input on the left and right. You know, it did look and feel noticeably bigger than a Nintendo Switch. And even with the new Switch having also a seven inch OLED screen in that case, uh, this has much bigger uh, grips on the side. There's a lot more volume there. Uh, it was comfortable to hold, and you saw the way I was holding it. I had my elbows tucked in or elbows on my knee, and this thing does weigh a bit more than a Switch. It's almost like a pound and a half. Uh, and so for long periods, which we didn't get to do here, I do imagine you'll want to find your own comfortable pose with this. And a one-handed operation, you know, where you're kind of using your finger to operate the touchscreen while gripping it, that's not something I think can be very sustainable. Um, you might want to kind of brace it with your knee or something, or even on a table as you manipulate that input. Uh, the thumbsticks felt good, the buttons felt good, you know, the, the triggers are single action, not dual action, which I guess is okay. I would have personally hoped for dual action, that's what I'm kind of used to on the, the VR controller side. Um, but one of the things that I asked a lot of questions about and I wanted was most curious about was were those track pads, right? Those little rectangular pads uh, underneath the thumbsticks. And I'd really come to like the, the track pads on the Steam controller. I thought the, the haptic feedback back on that controller was really, really cool, uh, really effectively simulated like a, a trackball or it was highly configurable so you could have just really responsive one-to-one -one movement. Uh, and also, if you remember, had those nice uh, concentric rings with a little bit of relief so you knew you know, where you were putting your thumb. Here, I felt myself a little bit disappointed with the, the trackpad feel. The haptics didn't feel nearly as um, just uh, powerful as the uh, as the linear actuators in the Steam controller, and they had them in trackball mode with acceleration, uh, which is not what I always like. Um, and because of the size of the pads feel smaller than what I'm used to on the, the bigger uh, Steam controller pa track pads, it's gonna take a little bit getting used to. Uh, there's also a gyro in here, and you, you heard them talk about the combination of using maybe the track pad plus the gyro, and that's not something that I'm comfortable or I feel adept at, so I can't really speak to the effectiveness of that. Uh, but the touchscreen, you know, touchscreen worked effectively as a touchscreen, and that's still kind of a, an uh, adaptation of the, uh, or an, uh, an abstraction of the, the, the cursor movement, right? Uh, when I was touching the touchscreen in some games and some of the UI, you actually see a mouse cursor pop up. And I think the idea is that the mouse cursor is not supposed to show up necessarily. It's supposed to just kind of seamlessly work in tapping points of the screen. Um, but uh, I think that's a part of that software interface they're gonna have to still work on. And one of my biggest takeaways is that there's a lot of difficulty in developing a software interface in this version of Linux Steam OX for this form factor. I know Valve has a ton of experience with big picture mode and optimizing and refining Steam for Windows desktop and Linux desktop, uh, but this does feel like a whole 
different animal. You know, as I talked about it in the beginning, think of it as a gaming laptop, where the only way you would primarily expect a user to interface with it is with uh, a gamepad controllers and a touchscreen. Uh, even though you could attach uh, other peripherals to it as well, and the UI, you know, navigating uh, through the menus and even the overlays in terms of popping in all the the brightness and Wi-Fi and and other connective settings that felt that looked looked good. It looked as expected. I think there could be some improvements in terms of the responsiveness, which hopefully will will come later. Uh, but once you're launching a game, that's where I felt like there was going to need to be a lot of work. You know, clicking a game, clicking the play button. Uh, I would first see uh, some pre-caching. The, the Vulkan uh, compiler would uh, have to adapt the game to work through Proton, and I presume this only happens the first time you launch a game, but that was a little bit of an extra loading time in the beginning. And then you saw, as you saw in some of that B-roll, you know, some of the games have different pop-ups with Origin, or uh, there, there are, you know, the, the it wasn't as seamless as a traditional game console, and especially like something like Nintendo Switch, where you expect to launch a game and basically be in there right away. Here, it still felt closer to a PC experience, which this is, it's a PC, um, but the expectation of having a game console that's you know a, a, a handheld gaming device is that things are supposed to be more responsive or supposed to launch and uh, be more frictionless, be a little bit more of a seamless experience. And I think they're working toward that. They're getting these units out to developers, and they say that they're going to encourage developers to make sure games are optimized to not just for performance, but optimized in terms of how they launch and have you know maybe come uh, preloaded with uh, configuration settings uh, and input mappings that best suit uh, the Steam Deck. Um, which is uh, something that we'll have to wait and see if that actually uh, comes to fruition. And right now I could see this being something that uh, a lot of experienced PC gamers and people who who have who have a big Steam library are fine tolerating some of that friction in launching games. But for someone who is considering this as maybe an alternative to Nintendo Switch, if Valve wants that to be a target market, I think they're going to have to make this a little bit smoother in uh, in in getting the games to launch. Because you know the games library didn't have the Steam Deck in mind. You know, they're taking advantage of the whole back catalog of PC gaming uh, as opposed to asking developers to develop specifically for this device, uh, which is what a company like Panic is doing with their Playdate handheld um, gaming device. Uh, so super interesting. Again, there's so much more we want to be able to test and, and figure out with this and, and maybe do a teardown in the future. but. I want to thank Val for inviting us up there uh, to be able to ask our questions and try and have some hands-on time with the Steam Deck. And also a big shout out to Bill Duran from our team uh, for tagging along and uh, helping run camera for this shoot. It's been a long time since I got to see Bill in person, so that was a lot of fun as well. But thank you so much for watching this video. And if you have more questions about our hands-on time with the Steam Deck, feel free to post them in the comments below, and I'll do my best to answer them as best I can. But until next time, I'm Norm. I'll see ya. Bye.